Hey folks, uh, so thanks for coming on. Uh, testing, um, testing, the uh, the one, two, panel. Three, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Hey everybody, so uh, the panel's going to come on in about five minutes. Um, there's another channel you can watch this on, it's a live stream channel. Um, it's called Other Possibilities. Go ahead and switch over to that channel because they're going to have interactive chat. And, um, through that channel on other possibilities, you'll be able to pose questions to the moderator. So we have a live pad yeah. set up on stage uh, so go ahead and do that and uh, thanks for coming on so early um, we've got two cams set up here so uh, hang in there and we'll be live uh, well we are live but we'll, the program will start at 4.35 good evening everybody or good afternoon Welcome to OPN. Um, we're working in a combined production with Organizer X this afternoon. This is a uh, live veterans panel discussion from Tacoma Park, Maryland. Um, you can see our friend John Zangus there on the panel on the left side. And I don't have the names of the other gentlemen at hand. Um, on the uh, screen you should be seeing uh, two panels. One will be where the fellows are sitting at the table and the other backdrop is going to be a live moderator who will be um, keeping an eye on the question pad that clearly just put up for us. And so if you guys want to participate you can uh, jump right in and uh, put a message on the pad and hopefully the moderator will catch it and uh, get your questions to the panel. So. Uh, pretty, pretty serious issues around the uh, veterans, um, lack of veterans benefits. I can uh, switch to my little splash screen, and this is one of the uh, one of the signs they've had up at the visual, at the vigil, um, which is a sad but true tragedy. Um, so if I could get an AV check from OPN's chat that would be helpful uh, just so we can see if we have good levels and all that during the panel my mic will be muted and uh, we'll be picking up the sound from the um, panel discussion itself so a lot of people have worked hard on this clearly thank you so much for all your work um, thank you rise for putting us up on OP uh, on global revolution We'll be live with the panel discussion starting in a few minutes. We're just tidying up and waiting for the room to get some more people in it. Um, I don't know, we don't really have an ending time, so we'll go as long as there's substantive content and compelling content. And we appreciate everybody for tuning in. I want to give credit to John Zangus, our friend out of D.C., who helped uh, pretty much was the driving organizer of this. Our friend Or Organizer X, who is on the scene running the cameras, he's uh, providing the feeds for me and I'm mixing in OPN World Headquarters. So uh, some new stuff. So the moderator's taking the seat and I think we'll be starting in just a minute. Thanks for watching.
Uh, please, you all don't fight over those seats out there. Uh, we'll uh, accommodate the rest of you. Uh, I want to thank everybody at GR for putting us on. Also, Robert Soames for putting us on Occupy Forum. Thank you for that. And any other channels that I'm not aware of that might be covering this tonight, thank you very much. panel here in Washington. Good evening and welcome to the veterans who are camped at Greater Plaza protesting in front of the Veterans Administration building in downtown Washington, D.C. Their effort was to speak to Leon Panetta, the Secretary of the Veterans Affairs, about concerns they had with the veterans and the treatment the veterans were receiving, the veterans who were returning from combat duty, and veterans who are homeless, jobless, and on the street. Some of their concerns regarded suicide rates with veterans. Veterans were killing themselves at the rate of 18 per day. In fact, one every 90 minutes takes their life. During this show, we'll have veterans speak about the issues. They will come to you with some stories of their experiences in war and on the street. Some of the veterans are homeless. Some of their concerns about suicides and about homelessness and about joblessness are concerns they've carried with them for years. Some of the statistics regarding veterans are very stark. Nine percent of the world of nine percent of the American population are veterans. Of the veterans, of the people who are homeless, twenty five percent, that's one in four of veterans are homeless. Suicides are one of the most damaging things to veterans today. 6,200 to 5, uh, 6,200, 6,500 veterans kill themselves every year. From the beginning of the show until the end, two veterans will take their own lives. Most of these lives are taken by the use of handguns. The VA is allocated $26 billion a year to care for veterans. One issue that the veterans will talk about tonight has to deal with claims and the delays of claims. Veterans need claims to be pro uh, promulgated instantly upon their release from duty. Over 10,000 veterans are, in are injected back into the system once they get out of the military. We don't know what the solution is, what the VA needs to do, but we do know, need, but we do know that what is being done is, is woefully inadequate. It, it had been our aim to express our concerns directly to the public affairs of the Veterans Administration. However, that meeting did not occur. So the vigil that transpired 72 days ago became a full-fledged protest. Every day there are veterans outside the administration. This has never happened before. They have built art signs, protest signs, and signs of their anguish about the treatment they're receiving or the lack of treatment. So today we will be discussing these issues directly to you, the American public. Tonight's moderator, Todd Fine, will pose questions that are available that you send to us from online. You can do that by the OPN network. Todd will give you the detail of that. I'd like to introduce the panel. Ray Boyd, who is a graphic artist and who is honorably discharged from the United States Marine Corps. 
I'd like to he is a homeless veteran. He will tell you his story. Very nice, sitting next to him. He is a, an advocate for veterans. He's also been involved in the Occupy movement on different protests throughout the country. And Mr. Willis is also a combat veteran. He served honorably as well. And then myself, I served in the Marine Corps as well. I'm turning it over now to Todd Clark. Thank you all for uh, being here tonight and for watching on our computer. And this is okay. well, actually, you may notice it's a heavy night for us. You can notice some of us are a little bit and for maybe sad and maybe more than usual. We have a lot of things actually, to be may notice it's a heavy night saddened about every day. Some of us are a little bit our friends and obviously the suffering of the veterans themselves. Liquid plumber double impact. Double impact. Oh. I'm here to snake the drain. I'm here to flush the pipe. Liquid Plumber Double Impact has twice the drain clearing power with a plumber snake to grab deep clogs and a powerful gel to finish off the rest, baby. Liquid Plumber Double Impact. I'm a homeless veteran. Uh, I'm an artist. I'm an activist. Uh, as uh, was alluded to, uh, we lost a very dear friend. And uh, uh, Mira Davit and um, giant hole in my heart today. But uh, the Peace House, where we all work and live, um, I know I say I'm homeless, but I've been graciously adopted by the Peace House. And uh, it's it's a source of activism and. Uh, Part of that is uh, the occupation at the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, and uh, I'm proud to be there, and I'm proud to serve my brothers and sisters uh, of all branches of the military, and uh, I'll pass the mic on to someone else now. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm Barry Knight. I served in the military in the 80s, 19th MP Company, Air Board. I got heavily involved with the Occupy movement when it kicked off last year and I soon came to realize it was more than just about corrupt banks and as I learned more and more about these veterans issues uh, it's is simply unacceptable the care or I should say the lack of care that they're receiving after having served their country I guess we'll be talking more about that as the discussion progresses but um, just to reiterate the thoughts about Mira, we lost a uh, great spirit and she was the embodiment of the life she was full of energy, full of compassion cared very deeply, not only about the issues, but the people around her, and she's going to be missed very much. We lost a great spirit, and she's the embodiment of the life. My name is Daryl Willis. Uh, I was in 2nd Battalion, A Company, deployed to Somalia in 1993, also Bosnia in early 93. Um, I'm I feel very, my heart's very heavy um, because, uh, you know, Mira had a lot of energy and she had a lot of spark. She was very tenacious and um, I, uh, I really think that she really gave a lot of positive energy to the Peace House and to not just Occupy but activism and uh, she, she, was, uh, she was very good at what she did and she fired up a lot of people and she we will be deeply missed and we will carry it on. My name is John Zangus. I'm an activist in my community. I am very interested and engaged with the community on behalf of veterans. Uh, my family has paid a dear price uh, for our troops being deployed to war. Uh, my father served in Vietnam two tours and my brother served in Iraq three tours. Um, my concern is that there are too many veterans on the street and a lot of these veterans are folks that don't want to ask for help. My concern, my con another concern is that the homelessness and it's with heavy heart that I see these uh, men and women on the street struggling just to, to they call it staging, um, just to get something to eat. There is more than enough facility 
uh, given by our Congress to the Veterans Administration. And I don't want to take anything away from what the VA does. The VA is doing a heck of a lot with what they've got. But as evidenced by the numbers, I believe that these these things that they do are not up to the task that needs to be tasked, that needs to be done. Um, my interest was to organize this for all veterans because when we tried to meet with the with uh, the public affairs, we tried to get them to at least come talk to us in front of the VA. They ignored us. It was, it was, it was pretty hurtful, actually, being out there day after day after day with these folks, seeing them struggle. Um, I'm blessed I'm not homeless, and I do have employment, but a lot of the veterans don't, and this is in the nation's capital. It's, it's just unacceptable for this many veterans to be on the street, and there are allocations to, for these folks to be given homes. I believe it's 13 vouchers a year are given, or 13 vouchers a month. But there are far more veterans out there on the street. You can, you can, as a veteran, you can look at them and see who the veterans are just by the way they carry themselves, how the way they walk, how the way they talk. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Chuck. So I've, I've been watching the, the Occupy VA uh, effort over the, you, the last few months. It started in. It started, started in uh, September. It was October before. It was October first day. September. And started. it's interesting to me how the this was sort of it wasn't out there for the Occupy movement. It was this expression that we need to be in your face. That these these problems can't be ignored. And we need to have a presence. And you need to see us. It wasn't out there. Sort of the cry for help. And I, I want I wanted to ask you in your face if people could speak about what. The occupation of the VA meant in terms of the larger Occupy movement, and what 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 they felt that the occupation of the VA meant in terms of anybody. The larger Occupy movement. Well, yeah, um, what the Occupy movement did basically um, sparked a fire that will hopefully engulf the apathy that America is drowning in right now. And um, at the VA, we simply adopted one of those tactics, like. He said, getting up in their face. Um, to be frank, I don't want to be cynical here, and I don't want to discourage people from taking action. Call your congressman, call the Committee of Veterans Affairs, call the Appropriations Committee, and keep the pressure on them. But we can't wait for our government to start fixing some of these problems. We have to take it among ourselves. One of the beautiful things I've saw um, has happened with the Occupy movement. You'll look up at Occupy Sandy. The relief efforts by occupiers are outpacing those of the Red Cross and the National Guard. Um, so there's another rolling jubilee where we're buying up debt on pennies on the dollar and forgiving debt, um, active in uh, preventing home foreclosures, physically getting on the ground at the house and physically stopping home foreclosures. So although it's important to try to work within this broken system to get some of the changes that are so desperately needed, I think it's imperative that uh, people take it upon themselves to work outside of the system also. And we need veterans to start helping veterans also. Because um, again, we want to make changes within the government. We want to get the funds needed and the uh, people resources allocated that we just so desperately need. We can't wait anymore because it's nothing less than a crisis that's taking place right now. 18 veterans a day taking their own lives along with one active duty soldier. Every single day are taking their own lives. If two people get bit by a mosquito and die, it's a national panic. It's on the nightly news and everyone's talking about it. But this crisis that's occurring right now with our veterans is, seems to be blacked out by the media and we need attention drawn to it. Which, again, is a good tactic of the Occupy movement, getting right up in people's faces and getting the public attention that's so, so needed to address these issues. Um, I, uh, again, Ray Boyd, uh, I'd like to paint the picture of the Occupy, how it occurred at the VA, and uh, make it a little more clear. Uh, there had been a handful of, uh, of veterans holding the Occupy at Freedom Plaza who maintained it even after the whole camp had left. And there was one tent sitting curiously out in Freedom Plaza 
uh, an, an army tent, and it was manned by uh, uh, several veterans, uh, Edward Hunt, uh, Frosty, uh, Bill Minuti, uh, John Penley, and, and these men dedicated themselves to keeping that presence ever in people's faces so that the plight of the American veteran uh, could be taken care of. Well, around uh, the time we were planning this occupation, which was actually going to be a one-day event uh, at the VA, uh, we had uh, received a call, uh, Frosty had, saying that uh, a meeting had been arranged and that uh, they would meet us out on the sidewalk while we occupied, uh, hear our grievances, and address them as best they could or discover routes and avenues that would meet with the needs of uh, vets. Well, we went there for that meeting and uh, no one ever came. And several of the vets, card-carrying vets, uh, attempted entry into the building to try to find out and determine exactly why um, someone hadn't come out as they had discussed and promised and uh, meet with us. And uh, Homeland Security was uh, guarding the doors and they were beaten back and uh, refused entry into their own building, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs. Well, um, vets being as they are fighters uh, by nature, uh, decided, well, if you're not going to hear us, then you're going to see us. And so they established the Occupy the Department of Veterans Affairs, and they sit out there every day now. And uh, I applaud everyone who, uh, who uh, stands up for us and fights for us. Um, relative to that, I just, uh, in this discussion panel, I uh, emailed uh, the subcommittee of Veterans Affairs uh, in our Congress, and emailed... Uh, the message is this. We vets know what goes on, and it saddens and sickens us. Eighteen vets and one active duty member commit suicide daily. Of 9% Americans homeless, 25% are vets. Benefits and services take a back seat to America's warmongering. $331 billion for defense and defense contractors, etc., Meanwhile, undisclosed amounts of money earmarked for Veterans Affairs are squandered on pleasure conferences by the Veterans Affairs Administration and field trips. Um, an example being they uh, recently took a trip to Italy and uh, spent untold monies of, uh, uh, of the Veterans Affairs that is supposed to be disseminated down to the, uh, the troops who are coming home and the ones that pre-existed uh, our current wars. And uh, 26 billion for veteran services uh, is what allocate, is allocated in our discretion, discretionary budget uh, for vets. Yet we just sent 70 billion to Israel to continue a several, several decades long genocide. We can't even get an authority of that VA to speak to our grievances, but I shouldn't be surprised because neither can you. Congress petitioned the VA to find out how much money was spent at an Orlando conference uh, of the Veterans Affairs money. Um, what they received back was uh, $20 million. Then they received another notification, oh, I'm sorry, we were wrong. It was a hundred million dollars. Then they received another notification. It's really hard to say no one kept any accurate records of how much money was spent. And these are the people who are serving us. These are the people who are in place to take care of our needs. And it, it sounds to me like they're having parties over there. Um, Anyways, I close the uh, email with, uh, we want and deserve answers. We want to talk to you. We serve. Serve us. I love this country. Don't you? So I just wanted to let you know that uh, we take our uh, jobs here on the front line of uh, getting these benefits and services that we deserve and need uh, very seriously.
And uh, God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, from the, the internet. God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, from the, the internet about how people can observe some of the occupation or the actions associated with it. Um, I've, I've always thought that one of the, the main things about Occupy events themselves is is that we, you want people to be there, and this is really about physical presence, and I think that's what makes it powerful. But how can how can other people around the country, you know, vicariously observe this occupation? Are there live streamers? Are there ways to how people can observe some of the occupation or the actions associated? What I hear that person um, saying is how can I've, I've, I've always thought that one of the, the main things about Occupy events themselves is is that we, you want people to be there, and this is really about physical presence, and I think that's what makes it powerful. But how can how can other people around the country, you know, vicariously observe this occupation? Are there live streamers? Are there ways to, to be engaged? It's uh, a good question, actually. How? What I hear that person saying is, how can they become involved? It's one thing to sit on the sidelines and watch. It's another thing to become involved. Um, but at least taking an interest is the first step. And that's where it's going to come from. Um, our government is doing what it is able to do. What inspires change? What motivates us? It's what's inside that moves us. What moves you? Get the Scion story at Scion.com. in our government's history, Afghanistan, we're drawing down from that war. We have sent many troops into battles, into harm's way, and they're coming back, 30% of which have PTSD. So how does the community get involved in helping this situation? They used to say, when I was a kid, hire, don't forget, hire the vet. We have to give a hand up to our veterans. We have to give them opportunities and employment. Veterans are very loyal, and they're very reliable workers. And I know this because where I've worked, you can always tell the veterans were really they were really able to do their job. They were disciplined. They had natural tendencies to assume leadership roles. So employers really need to look closely at, at applications with veterans. I'm not saying take them above everybody else. But these folks really have proven to be very reliable. Even some of the veterans who have had issues with their service in the military. Sometimes they get out with what we call bad paper. Even those veterans want to do something good. They want to put back into their community. The other thing that people can do to help in their community is to take an interest in their veteran service organizations such as the American Legion or the, the disabled American veterans. A couple of hours a day volunteering down at your local VA facility is very helpful. There's always work to be done there. There's plant work to be done. There's outreach to veterans. And, you know, one of the things that really makes me feel good is just somebody reaching out and saying, thank you for your service when they find out that I'm a vet. It just makes my day. So little things like that. And it doesn't cost anything. You don't really need to, to throw $28 billion out of problem solving. If, if the community takes an active role in reaching out to the people, and it doesn't just have to be veterans, it can be homeless folks too. Anybody who's on the street really needs a hand up, and some of them really do have skills. We have a veteran here who has an incredible artistic capability, and he's homeless. Homeless doesn't mean capability. I'm, I want to ask a question that I think is it's a difficult one, but I think it, it's something that we always have to, to be conscious of. And that is, is, does the focus on veterans' issues per se and emphasizing veterans, do you ever worry that that may distract from the systemic problems that produce these conditions for these veterans, like the wars themselves or the overall circumstances in the economy? It, do you, how do you think that the uh, issue of veterans should be cast in that context? I guess my concern is that sometimes I worry that if we were to, you know, fully fund the VA and everybody would, would get all these great benefits, you know, obviously they deserve everything, but that <coughs> that is part of the institution of the war making itself, is to kind of separate people from the mainstream. 
if I can just comment on that, um, I don't think um, taking care of the veterans more or shirking that responsibility and taking care of them less will have any effect um, on the wars themselves, but you did bring up an important issue. One of the reasons we have so many suicides, uh, it's great is the guilt of an unnecessary war. And I think, thanks to the internet, people are getting more informed about our foreign policy. You can call it nation building, or you can call it imperialism, but people are taking a look at the reasons we're supposedly going to war, and they're realizing we're going to war over lies. Um, some people might not agree with me on that. I just want to touch on Iraq as an example. We were told there was a 9-11 connection. There wasn't. That's been proven false. We've been told there was an Al-Qaeda connection. There wasn't any Al-Qaeda in Iraq before we got there. We were told about weapons of mass destruction. Yet another lie. But these are the reasons we went to war. Lie, 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 lie. And it's not the troops' fault. The big difference between the today and the protests of, say, the 60s were, one, the Internet, the information is getting out there. It is being made available to not just this country, but the globe. People are finding out the truth and not relying on a, a corrupt or biased corporate media for their information. Also, the big difference is troops are not coming home today, getting called horrendous things, getting spit on. These people realize it's not the troops' fault. Picture yourself a kid growing up in Detroit right now. You graduate high school. Your options are basically flip burgers, join a gang, or join, a mil join the military. And they look at those options and they pick what they feel is the most honorable choice, and that would be to join the military. And I would agree, one day that might have been true, but because of the actions of our government at present, this nation building, I call it imperialism, we are treating people like nothing more than resources that can be expended, expendable rather than human beings, and it's absolutely reprehensible. So I think speaking out against the war and not against the people that are sent to do the fighting, okay? they're the victims of this as much as everyone else that dies, hundreds of thousands of people. They're not the ones to be pointing the fingers at. The people you point the fingers at are the people sending these people off to war for corporate greed and profit. I'd also like to point out that uh, the discretionary budget for the United States last year was $665 billion. Discretionary are those budget items that are flexed. You can move a little money here, you can cut this program, put it there, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's the fixed budget, you know, stuff like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that you know there's a determined amount that you're going to be putting out, and it's there. This discretionary budget is so lopsided in favor of defense that it's sick-making. Um, $331 billion of $665 billion is earmarked for defense. And to put that even in further perspective, that same those same monies, that $331 billion, could be used to reduce class sizes from grades 1 to 3 to 15 students per class. It could restore and rebuild every school in America. It could make sure that every child has Head Start opportunity, and it could ensure that every child in America would have health care coverage. And still, we would have twice the defense budget of any of our adversaries and all of our adversaries combined. That is insane. And the reason this continues to function as it does is because defense contractors um, are the largest donators to political campaigns in the country. I mean, they're the largest. So, more or less, our, our government is taking that money and putting it in a savings account called defense contractors and the interest on the loan comes in the form of <coughs> new weapons so we can kill each other better. And it's just a sick, vicious circle. I mean, we get, the government gives it to the defense contractors, the contractors give it back to the politicians, the politicians get elected, and they give it back to the defense contractors. And it goes on and on, and it's 
madness, madness. It's got to end, and if you want to get involved as a veteran, reach out to your Congress. Let them know that this is unacceptable. If you're an average civilian, reach out to your Congress and let them know this is unacceptable. We always say our children come first. We always say we support our troops. But when you compare the $331 billion that we give to destroy the world to the $26 billion we give to the men and women who try to do their best to serve their country, it, it's laughable. And, uh, and now we have children who uh, are going to dilapidated schools in overcrowded classrooms. They don't get an education. So we have a, a prison industrial complex as well now to give them a choice. You either go in the military or you go to prison. It's your choice. You know, pick it. And it's something that can be easily avoided just by, dispend, by distributing that discretionary budget uh, a lot more equitably to serve us all. I will just interject quickly. Dwight D. Eisenhower um, warned America about the military industrial complex in his farewell speech. And sure enough, today it has come to fruition. We are in a time of perpetual war. Um, if you have time, Google Wesley Clark when he did an interview on Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. He actually said, we have a policy in place that's designed for us to take over seven countries in five years. Those seven countries are um, Syria, um, Lebanon, Somalia, Sudan, um, Libya, I didn't already say that one already, um, and it's, it's going to end with Iran. Now these weren't policies where this country did this, we have to go get a united coalition to stop these atrocities from taking place. No, no, no. This was a forethought, premeditated plan for us to go to war. You don't go to war because you can, or because it's profitable, or because we have to get those resources, because somehow their oil got under our sand. No, you only go to war when it's absolutely last resort and every other option has been expended. But today, we look for reasons to go to war because it's profitable. For who? Well, certainly not the troops we're sending over there or their families that are losing their lives. Certainly not the hundreds of thousands of innocent people that live throughout the world that we are killing indiscriminately. Who benefits? As you mentioned, defense contractors, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Halliburton, and others. They make billions upon billions upon billions of dollars at the cost of human life. It is reprehensible. We write blank checks to defense contractors, and then the very people we send over there to do their fighting, to make their billions, are neglected when they get back home here to the States. What can we do about it? As I mentioned earlier, we don't have all the solutions, but we have to get enough people to shake off the apathy, wake up, call their congressmen. If you live near D.C., come on down. Go to the Rayburn Building. Go to the Cannon Building. You can go in and talk to your congressman. They even let me in there. So you can go in there too. <laughs> uh, but get active, get involved, and just say, we are mad as hell, what you're doing is reprehensible, we are not going to take it anymore, stop these illegal, needless wars, and by God, take care of the people you sent over there to do your dirty work in the first place. People got to get mad, outraged, and involved, and they have to do it now. Can't wait any longer. Uh, I want to turn the focus back onto the veterans' issues, if I could. Um, one thing that we had been discussing as an option to help get our system back on track is to get the veterans more intimately involved in some of the programs that the VA is offering. Um, one idea that I've been researching is called peer groups, which is a new idea, getting folks who have common issues together to speak. If you were to call the suicide hotline of the VA, and I don't know if anyone has a phone or the number, but if you were to call it right now, you're going to get a recording that says, we will take your number and we will call you back in 24 hours. That's the um, number right there. So Ray has the number. Maybe somebody can call that's that one. number and find out. Yeah, let's give it a shot. I want to read it off to the audience, too. Okay, Although, everyone. Uh, let, me, let me make my point, Ray. Yeah. My point is, is that if you're calling a, a number for suicide, you are calling because you're a janitor of your own you really need to speak to somebody. The Department of Defense has programs where they 
take and have a stand down, where they actually take, which is a great, a great program, where they actually take the entire military and they, for an entire day, they do training on this. Why doesn't our VA have a system where you can call, you can get the same type of response? The National you have a Also serving the Veterans Crisis Line. So, what, what, you get, what you're getting is reporting for service, okay? We are here to help. If you are a U.S. military veteran or current service member or are calling about one, please press 1 now. Otherwise, please. So, in essence, what we need to do is develop a, a, a peer outreach for folks to, to get the, uh, the assistance that they need. Um, another idea we were thinking of. Thank you for calling the Veterans Crisis Line. How can I help you? Uh, yes, ma'am. We're in a veterans discussion panel right now. We just wanted to show the uh, ludicrous nature of the functioning of your veterans uh, helpline. Uh, thank you. Bye. We actually reached a human being there, apparently, which is wonderful. But just to interject real quick, there's 19 uh, hotlines for the entire United States for veteran suicide hotline. And oftentimes, not in this instance, but oftentimes you will simply get a recording. And if you are at the end of your rope, I mean, a recording doesn't do it. So we need definitely, that's one thing that a solution is that get more hotlines and make sure they're manned 24 seven. Uh, they also uh, promise uh, that if you call this number, sure. that they'll, they'll re -react, react within 24 hours, which, you know, for someone contemplating suicide, uh, it's a little late. And it's, uh, it's increased in its, its sickness by the fact that all the, all the help is out there. I mean, there's hospitals everywhere. There's there. police everywhere. We introduce but we can't send the police over to you know, help this guy through a really tight spot. Um, no, we're going to wait 24 hours to first make sure you get the help you need. It's, it's insane. We created a host I, um, of innovations that have helped. I want to say I've been thinking about all, all, a lot of this stuff is really, really important, and I'm really uh, right now I'm looking for a job in addition to what I do is for independent media. And when I fill out a job application, I can't say because I'm dishonorably discharged because I refused to murder an innocent human being that was unarmed, and I would do it the same every time. So I can't say, because I have a dishonorable discharge, that I was in the United States Army, that I was an E-4 specialist, that I was in the 10th Mountain Division, and that I was on the ground serving people of a third world country who were starving to death. I can't say that because it hurts my credibility for the job. So I don't put it down. It's really frustrating because I want these people to know who I am in my heart and that I care about people, I love this country, and I, I'm just one man. I know that there are so many veterans that have so many problems with this. And um, it's, it's bad. So I'm continually looking for a job, but it's something that is it's conf it's conflicting. You know, maybe I can meet a supervisor who is in the service who understands the the ins and outs of what's going on with the lieutenant's problems, or what I'm doing as as a rifleman, or what it's like to be shot at. I don't expect the therapist I speak to to be a combat veteran. I love it when I speak to a person who says, welcome home, or when they say, my God, you know, it's so good you're alive. You know, I love that. But finding a job is hard, and you've got all, you've got 100 people looking for that same job. But um, the Occupy the VA, I've been down there a few times, and I've yet to stay overnight. But um, those people that are there are very, very important because they're representing thousands and thousands of men and women who are not getting the help they need. Um, and I, I just, I just can't, I can't say much more. Just that uh, 
you know, I'm really glad to be here with these brothers, and thanks for listening. One thing about the, the, the vigil at the Veterans Administration is that it's not just veterans. There are a lot of people that are there that are supporting veterans who are on the street as well and have taken up residence on the street. So we, they buoy us. They give us hope that there are other people involved in the vigil. Like I said before, the vigil has been going on for 72 days, and some of the folks that are there have actually been there every single night. They've stayed on that sidewalk. And in the last 72 days, there have been at least five days of constant rain when Hurricane Sandy hit. And we had to feed those folks. We had to bring them coffee and, and food in, in the middle of that storm. And it was kind of scary. The wind was blowing and, and stuff was breaking loose everywhere. Signs and tree branches were coming down. <coughs> but those folks were out there on the street in the vigil. They didn't go anywhere. They stayed there. In fact, I'd ask them to leave, and they refused to leave. Um, they said, we're not going anywhere. They're very stubborn. The veteran will, they're a stubborn breed. They'll give you their last cigarette. They'll give you your, their shirt off the back. And indeed, they had one of the guys out there actually gave his last coat to a homeless woman who was during Hurricane Sandy. She was wet. She was cold and shivering. He gave his coat to her. And the Metro had shut down. He gave his coat to her. And he was cold. So they're pretty selfless people. It's people helping people. You can't rely on the morally bankrupt machine to provide the help we need. I mean, it's got to be about people helping people, veterans helping people, fellow veterans. Yes, put the pressure on Congress, keep the pressure on, but again, I just, I've grown so cynical because of the lack of response I've seen from our government. So we've got to get up there and help each other. I just want to touch on something Daryl said, too. I have an honorable discharge. I served four years and almost four years before I got in a motorcycle wreck and had total knee reconstruction. Told me I couldn't jump out of planes anymore and I was given an honorable discharge. Meanwhile, he's sitting with a dishonorable discharge for doing, for obeying his oath. He did not obey an unlawful order. He did not kill an unarmed person, okay? an innocent person especially. But even if they're unarmed, if you have a chance to take that person, make them a prisoner instead, that's what you do. But again, our troops are over there, overseas, receiving orders to kill innocent people. And not just men, women, children. They are told to kill them. Um, we have a kid sitting in jail right now, going on two years, Bradley Manning, who released footage of some of these war crimes to the world, yet he's the one we prosecute for exposing war crimes, but the war crimes themselves continue to go unprosecuted, such as having our military fire on a hotel containing nothing but independent journalists because they are so afraid of the truth. Well, what the truth is going to come out whether they like it or not. It's the most powerful weapon out there. They have bombs, they have tanks, they have drones, they have bullets, but they don't have the most powerful weapon, which is the truth. And they can keep trying to hide it with all the corporate media spin that they can muster, but it's not going to hold up. The truth is a much more powerful weapon. And I'm glad it is just starting to get out there, and it's got to be spread like wildfire. So if you ask what you can do on an individual basis, get informed, get educated, get involved, and tell everybody you know, your friends, your family, your co-workers, until we get a critical mass of people where they can't ignore anymore. That's what we can all do on an individual basis. I'd also like to send a shame out to uh, DC's government. Um, operating under a $120 million surplus, they just recently cut uh, $7 million off the homeless services budget. And uh, it, it's just a barbaric act and uh, cruel and unusual punishment to a population that's already struggling just to keep food in their bellies and some sort of roof over their... Uh, their heads during uh, this winter. So, uh, yeah, just uh, I, I just want DC government to be shamed, shamed for what they've done. Uh, they should have increased the budget by seven million, not cut it. Yeah, we we have a uh, Barry just touched on that point of of what you can do, which is really to reach out in person and help. But we have also have a lot of questions online about if there's there about some legislation, specific legislation, if there's a, a specific thing out there right now. Apparently there was a bill that somebody's pointing to that was blocked 
Uh, I don't know all the details about it, but is there is there an act related to suicide or PTSD or funding for the VA? Is there something specific, you know, in Congress right now that, that people should go around, or is it more is it just a large systemic increase in the budget that they would ask for? Well, I've uh, I've had situations in my life that uh, have required the use of the VA, and in my dealings with them. Um, you become you become numb. It's uh, and you begin to realize that either I have to get a job with health care or uh, with health care coverage, or I'm screwed because you go to the VA and there's a line for any service you want because the budget is woefully inadequate, and by the time you would actually get the service you actually require, the need of that service is no longer needed. I mean, it's, so it's it's a catch-22. I mean, it, yeah, you have uh, benefits and services, but they're <coughs> not truly available because the budget doesn't cover it. And uh, the guys up top who are uh, uh, dispersing these monies are going off to Orlando or Italy and having a good time. And uh, uh, we need to put people in those seats at Veterans Affairs that are actually concerned with the well-being of the troops. And even though 35% of those people in that building are veterans, it, it should actually add to the fact that, I mean, the, the absurdity, and they, they should, I don't know how they sleep at night. Uh, it, it's ludicrous. Uh, but we need people in those seats who will delegate the monies um, appropriately. And um, it would be nice to see them actually cut their salaries to ensure that more of those monies are getting to the troops. Or, here's a really, really weird one. This is a stretch. How about taking some of that $331 billion and moving it over to, uh, well, like half of it. It should be half and half. If you're going to fight a war, half up. This is the money to fight the war. This is the money to rescue the guys who fought it and gals. Um, it, it's just ludicrous. It's a joke. It's a sick joke. And uh, we should all be up in arms and we should all be beating down the doors of Congress to get this changed. Beating them down. Uh, uh, our Constitution promises uh, redress for our grievances. And uh, if you've actually ever been involved in activism as we have, you know that uh, they don't want to hear any redress. They don't want to give you any redress of grievances. They don't even want to hear your grievances. You know, get the hell out of here. We'll send over 2,500 troops to clear a park of nonviolent protesters uh, as violently as possible so that they'll never come back again. That's uh, their answer to, that's their redress to our grievances. Get the hell out of here. If I could interject here, yes. right? Uh, the, according to Veterans bill was voted down in September. It was a jobs bill. I don't know the facts and circumstances of that, but it says that uh, the, the vote on it fell too short for a one billion dollar jobs bill. Now that money could easily have been allocated from another program. Uh, it's, it doesn't have to be additional expenditures. We can reallocate money from other programs, borrow a little bit from another program, anything to get these folks off the street. Defense. Um, it's, it goes without it's, it goes without saying that there are just too many folks. Too many, the percentages are just way out of whack for it to be that high, for it only to be nine percent of the population veterans, but also to have twenty five percent of the homeless at that rate. That's more than double what it should be. Do you have a there are, that? There are I, ha I have a link for that. There are compelling reasons why that that, that happens. Uh, folks, folks returning from combat are suffering easily, probably more. But 30, at least 30 percent of the folks going into the VA healthcare system are suffering from. They are diagnosed with PTSD. Um, a, a diagnosis for PTSD doesn't mean the 30 percent doesn't mean that all of them are being caught. Some folks get out and don't realize they have it. It doesn't manifest until sometime afterwards. You may not even know you have it but it affects you in, in a lot of different ways. And it certainly makes you unemployable. 
it makes it very difficult for you to go to work, to just to concentrate. You have flashbacks, issues, and a stressor could be anything from seeing uh, a climax event. I've spoken to veterans who were in Iraq who had to clean up the body parts after IEDs went off, or their comrades, they had to carry parts of their comrades back. And it's, it's, it affects you for your life. So these types of folks are coming back that have suffered these types of consequences, and they're just not able to work. One of the ideas we were proposing was they have something in the military called a stop loss. And what that means is when you're on active duty, when you're sent to a combat situation, you're active duty time can be extended so you can finish your combat tour. Well, we would propose that when a veteran is leaving the service, they have a, not maybe a stop loss, but a life skills program. They take these veterans and they put them into this program where they can get skills that they need, make sure that they're getting the training, make sure that they're rehabilitated from the, the stresses of war. And this might be a very great opportunity to implement the peer group training or the peer group interface. Again, peer groups are groups that are set up by people with similar conditions, similar problems. They can speak to each other and they can, they can understand each other. In fact, sometimes it's easier to speak in a peer group than it is to speak to a doctor who may actually understand mental health conditions. But peer groups have been shown to actually work. It might actually be a good thing to have peer groups of veterans who can help each other through their experiences for more, instead of putting them out into the street where they may not get, where they will not get the services and, and may not even know how to ask or may not even want to ask for those services. Any more questions? To um, I have a question. This is, I guess, a, maybe we don't have really young people who are in this recent one in Iraq, but. The recent wars, I guess on the surface they look, maybe people are surprised that there's so much PTSD, that there's so much suicide, given the fact that the casualty rates aren't as high as like a World War II or a Vietnam. But there seems to be something psychological about these wars, maybe with the, all of the technology, now we're seeing the, the drones. Do you think that there's, a, there's maybe an even different type of PTSD that's emerging that that is, is, could be even, you know, just as severe, even if it's not just uh, seeing, you know, blood and guts and, and, and what we assume PTSD to be. If I could, on that. Yeah, PTSD is a condition which is, happens as a result of post-stress. Remind you that GEICO has delightful customer service. We have a special video just for you. And now for dolphins. Well done, flippered mammal. Ten seconds of delight from Geico customer service, where we can't be happy until you're delighted. so broken that the laws that are on the books right now that were written during the 40s, 50s, and 60s and improved under the COBA, the Court of Veterans' Appeals, those laws are not adequate. They don't cover the situation for a veteran who has been deployed so many times. In Vietnam, they had what was called the draft, and it was... in. They called it the induction. What it was, was you received your, your draft card and your number was called up and you reported for duty. You served two years, six months of training, one year was deployed or 13 months where you were deployed to Vietnam and then you came back, you reassimilated into society, you got your treatment. If you were injured, you got out. And we know for a fact that many Vietnam era veterans committed suicide. Their names are not on the wall. Their names are not on the wall for a reason. Their names are not on the wall for a reason, and that's because the Veterans Administration does not recognize suicide as a disability. There is a small, uh, about 18 by 18 inch stone somewhere in that area which recognize those who have died, also those who have died, and that encompasses those who have committed suicide. But they will not put the names of veterans on that wall who committed suicide after the fact. Go ahead. Raymond Jaffe, he was in the 10th Mountain Division with me in Somalia in 93. He returned from Afghanistan in 2009. 
lived in Seattle, Washington, committed suicide after being stopped lost four times. His last tour in Afghanistan, all he did was guard poppy fields. That's all he did. And the realization of being lied to is devastating for somebody to have been through what they've been through, what I saw, re-enlist after 9-11, go through the meat grinder, and then take your own life. Survive, and then take your own life. The destruction of the, of the spirit is just immeasurable. So, that's happening there in Afghanistan. Our soldiers are being used to guard opium for our drug cartels in the United States of America, for morphine, Vicodin, Xanax, War II, about half the casualties were um, civilian, and that steadily increased from Korea, from Vietnam, and now well over 90% of the casualties dying in war are civilians. And again, great is the guilt of an unnecessary war. And I thought a lot of the, I think a lot of the troops are placing that guilt on themselves when again it, they should really be pointing the finger at the people sending them over there for absolutely horrid, despicable reasons. Um, when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, one of the things that really horrified me Okay, well, you have to spend that million dollars, because if you don't, whatever you return back to dollars left of your one million dollar budget next year you're only going to get seven hundred thousand dollars because you return three hundred thousand dollars so what happens in September just before the end of the fiscal year these units all these units all throughout the military all throughout the government are going out and they're buying stuff they don't even need they buy superfluous stuff they'll uh, I worked at uh, at TABC and they bought like this huge uh, copier that we didn't really need, but they bought it and it actually was put to good use. But the reality was it, it wasn't needed. We spent that money because if we didn't spend it, we wouldn't have been able to spend it next year. We have to restructure the way our government does business. We have to restructure the way our military does business. If we don't, we're fools. We're allowing, and, and what really makes me angry is that Congress will sit up there serving we the people. They'll sit up there and they'll say, well, what we'll do is we need to cut somewhere. We need to cut spending somewhere. Let's go uh, hit uh, Social Security or Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Let's take money from there and throw it over here. And you're cutting services to people who, I mean, that's their, their life. They're on fixed incomes. They're just trying to survive. And you're taking monies from them when you have $331 <coughs> billion dollars that you could easily, and not even feel it, you could easily take a little bit of money from. And it, it wouldn't even be noticed. And it, it's reprehensible. Those congressmen are not serving us. Your politicians are not serving you. And it's almost like saying voting doesn't matter because we're going to do whatever the hell we want and screw the whole lot of you. And it's sad because we serve this country because we love this country and we still love this country. And that's why we're out here screaming into these microphones. So and, uh, we love you all. I mean, that's what it's about. It's about the people. It's not about the money. It's not about the corporations. It's not about the politicians. It's about us. We the people.
So again, I think we're getting questions where people are asking, what can they do? I mean, that's always what people want to know. What what can they do? Give us suggestions. Maybe, John, we could we could conclude with this where everybody says what they would like yeah. to do. If we could we could go around. Uh, but first of all, I'd just like to say, obviously, a lot of passion here and, and concern about what the plight of veterans is today. You hear it in the voices, both in tone and words. Um, and what the, the, I guess the burning question is, what can people out there do? Everybody wants to help. Uh, I'll go over again. The, the statistics are, I don't even need to go over them again. They speak for themselves. The statistics indicate that the system is really broken. Um, the worst thing we can do is t to continue to be quiet about it. There's a quote, Barry knows it by heart, I, I don't know it, but when, when people remain quiet about something that they know that is wrong, and I'm paraphrasing it, that's the big mistake. You need to speak up about things and get involved. Getting involved can easily be something as simple as volunteering at a local VSO, Veteran Service Organization. There are many of them out there. There's the Wounded Warrior Project that's going on. It's actually very successful in Washington, D.C. The Wounded Warrior Project is reaching back, grabbing people. This is a nonprofit organization. I happen to know some of the folks on that committee. They're actually reaching and taking some of the veterans before they get into the system as they come out and giving them homes and giving them the training they need. The Veterans Administration is getting $28 billion a year to address the issues with the veterans, okay? But money isn't what it's, like Ray said again, money is not what it's all about. It's about people helping people, getting involved in your community. You could set up your own VSO in your community. We set up this panel just by speaking to people who were interested, and we put it together. And I would also, before we go, I would like to acknowledge this community collective called the Electric Maid in Tacoma, which was gracious enough to let us use their facility. And thank you very much, Brian, and the folks who run this. This is a, a collective in Tacoma, and they just opened their doors to us because they're concerned about this as much as we are. And OPN. And, and OPN, OPN, who is broadcasting this, Organizer X, who is here volunteering to run the communications, the mics, and the live stream with Todd here, too. But again, what, what can people do? It's reaching out in your community, volunteering at VSOs, and helping veteran, hire, hire veterans for positions. Give them a chance. Give them a hand up. You can go to your local church and, and bring supplies. There are a lot of veterans out on the street. In fact, right now, the, the vigil is going on in front of the VA. Go down there and bring some water or some, some food. They need food and water every day. And I'm going to turn it over to my brother here, Willis. Uh, don't join. Um, if people I'm, don't show uh, up, they won't have it. I am adamant about this. And a dear friend of mine made this very clear to me. And it just struck me. I said, yeah, you know, it sounds real simple, but that machine is just starving for new souls. And if they don't get new souls, it's going to run out. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> the kid that's going to, like, join the United States Army thinks he's going to go and kill for God and country. That has to be stopped at childhood. Children need to learn that war is not the not the not the the solution. You know, it may look glamorous in a movie, but boy, let me tell you, it's not. So let's not join. Hopefully oh, that. Um, again, what was once a lot of people looked at as an honorable life path it is no longer simply because it's being abused. It's being used as a tool to for corporate greed and profit and we're sacrificing lives, not only our young men and women in the US, but hundreds of thousands of lives throughout the world. So I support that too. Carl Sagan, I believe, said sometime they're gonna have a war and nobody will show up. I'm looking forward to that day. Um, as far as the quote you were looking for, I think it was by Abraham Lincoln where he said to sin by silence when you should protest makes cowards of men. So what can you do? 
to, um, get involved with different organizations that John here mentioned. Um, call your congressman relentlessly, not just once and be done. Call him. You can call him again next week. But what progress have you made on my last call? And find out, I find out all the names of the people that voted down the um, bill for uh, jobs, for vets, because the people, they, we know how our congressmen vote. We have to take the time to actually investigate and research that for ourselves because you're not going to hear about it on Fox or MSNBC or um, the CNN. Okay? You've got to turn off that weapon of mass deception, which is another big reason kids are lining up to go to war. It's all glamorous. They see these commercials and it's wonderful and they see them climbing the obstacle course, but they don't see the, your friend's head get blown off right next to you. They don't show you dead, innocent, two, three, four, five-year-old children that got killed in a drone attack, and you got to go clean that up. Hey, they don't show the horrors of war. They show the glamour of it, and they attract uh, that. So again, talk to young people thinking about entering the military, and applaud them for their, their courage, but explain to them the truth that it's certainly not all it's cracked up to be. Right, I, I would like to add to that, uh, um, set aside a, a day a month to sit down at your computer and send out emails to your congressmen, send out emails to the committees and subcommittees that handle a lot of these budgetary items, and let them know how you feel. Let them know that it's unacceptable that more than half our discretionary budget is spent on defense. Um, it's like 50 times what... All our adversaries combined spend on defense together. So, I mean, point those things out. And do it every month. Every month, set aside that day to say, I'm going to be an asshole today and piss off my politicians. And piss them off. That's what we're... It, you have a civic responsibility. <coughs> a civic responsibility, especially as a veteran, to sit down at that computer and hound the hell out of your politicians. And I also want to point out that the NDAA of uh, 2012 signed away your right to an attorney, your right to know your charges, your right to a speedy trial. They can literally sweep you off the street, make you disappear from the planet, and as a veteran, you're earmarked for that because you're a veteran. You know how to hurt people. You know, that you've been trained to kill. Um, they want... It's going to come to the day when they're going to start utilizing that tool that they've just secretly stored behind America's back. The National Defense Authorization Act. Read it, people. It's taking away your rights. And, I might point out, it's an act of treason to remove any one of the first ten amendments from the Constitution called your Bill of Rights. So anybody who signed and approved the National Defense Authorization Act, which includes your president, Mr. Obama, anyone who signed that is a treasonist and should be put on trial. Uh, it's scary. It's scary. Now we have 30,000 drones Flying Two over our nationwide country, 4G been network has the U.S. covered from why? coast to coast. 30,000 military drones Reaching over, over 220 our million on Americans. a constant basis. See That's for yourself. 600 drones per state. Uh, those are things to be afraid of. And those things to question. And those things to approach your politicians when you're being that asshole once a month. I just want to touch on something real, real quick uh, on that. Yes, our rights are being stripped away, and it's not just National Defense Authorization Act, it's the Patriot Act, it's HR 347, there's a slew of them out there. But one thing I just wanted to mention before we wrap this up is a statistic that while we have kind of an unbalanced panel in here, um, there are no women up here. But I would like to point out another very important issue facing veterans, especially women, uh, female veterans, and the fact that in their time of service, 50 5% of the women who join the military are sexually harassed at some point during their career. And as far as sexual assault goes, that's almost a quarter. Almost one out of four women are sexually assaulted during their service, which is another um, horrific statistic that needs to be addressed as well. I just wanted to get that in there because I realize we have no women on the panel. Perhaps yeah, we I, should. I, I really did try to get somebody 
uh, several folks I did ask, but it just didn't come to fruition. Um, before we close, I did want to acknowledge that a comrade, and, and some of the panelists had mentioned it earlier, acknowledged that a pan, a pan, a, an activist in our community passed away last night. Her name was Mira Davidi. Um, Davit. Mira Davit. She was a very passionate young woman. She was 27 years old. Um, she championed the cause of her people. She also championed the cause of voices who couldn't speak out for themselves. She's been involved with the Peace House for the better part of the year. She was also known as the enforcer. Sometimes she had to make decisions which weren't popular, but she got things done. And last night she, she left this earth, she passed away, and passed on into the Spirit of God. We're going to miss her dearly, and we'd like to dedicate this program to her memory. And we did, we, thank you, John. We did also get one, one recommendation through OPM, which is kind of interesting. They suggested that, I would suggest that you could foster a dog and give that to a vet with PTSD, or uh, or work on a service dog for visual sound and other conditions. Um, and I think I'd like to uh, to close tonight with a quotation from from Mira that that I saw that she had written in an article actually connecting. Um, her, her situation with the Palestinians in Occupy Palestine to uh, why she joined Occupy uh, Wall Street and Occupy DC and why she stuck with it. And she said, when we're feeling blue, and I think that's con especially good for situations like this, problems that seem so overwhelming and, and, and we are inevitably going to fail, it seems like, in addressing them, we can remind ourselves that, she said, when we falter, we can follow the advice of French novelist uh, Albert Camus, who said, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. And I think that's a why we come here tonight uh, in, our, in our morning, because we want to be with others. We want to, to have no constraint and, and say what we feel as, uh, as brothers, as veterans, and as, as people here. So. Thank you very much. I'll be thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank again Electric Bay for graciously loaning this space. I would like to thank my fellow panelists for coming. Todd Bond, thank you so much for moderating tonight's event. Organizer X, thank you. And OPN, all the fine folks on the OPN network, thank you so much for your diligence and broadcasting and recording tonight's recording. Uh, we will be having some events in the future, so stay tuned to OPN, Open Network Broadcasting. We will be marrying and networking more activist programs from this site. We plan to have, sometime in the future, some protest songs and some performances by some of the area artists. So stay tuned. We'll be back. Thank you. Thank you.